Okay, thank you very much. Um, I've been having quite a few collaborations with people from Berkeley, so it's a pleasure to be here. The project I'll be talking about is not an exception. It's in collaboration with Ben Chandrasekharan, who I guess left Berkeley a few months ago, um, and Ned Engelhardt and Sebastian Fischetti. Um, in the introduction, I'll be giving some background motivation for the computation of a specific quantity in quantum gravity. This quantity is the free energy. And then I'll provide a general prescription for how to compute this object in a way that takes into account contribution from Euclidean wormholes. As we've seen, these are very important in recent years. And then, as usual, um, I'll have to apply this prescription to JT gravity because if you don't apply things to JT gravity, no one, no one listens to you. Um, this will be, this, the story I'll tell you about JT gravity will, not, will be open-ended. Uh, because this is work, work in progress. And in that discussion, I'll give you some of the near-term goals that we have, as well as some of the open questions that will remain and that we would like to investigate in the future. So let me begin with um, some general picture. In recent years, we've been learning a lot about quantum gravity by looking at the Euclidean gravitational path integral, which here I'm introducing as some formal object as an integral over matrix G um, on a manifold M subject to, subject to certain boundary conditions. Here's some manifold B at some conformal boundary. Um, the reason this object is formal is because typically we don't even know how to define it, let alone compute things with it. In certain regimes like in JT gravity, we do have some nice control over it and so we have the Beautiful story by Satchenker and Stanford where we can compute this exactly and show that it's dual to a matrix model. But more generally, the only um, tractable approach we have for dealing with this object is semi-classical, looking at saddles at a classical or semi-classical level. And that's the regime in which we'll be interested in um, later in this talk. It's generally assumed that what this object computes is some sort of partition function and I'm being vague here because it's not exactly clear what it is that we are computing when we perform this path integral. So here I'm writing this overline over the partition function to denote perhaps some ensemble average, but I'm not going to adhere to any particular interpretation of the gravitational path integral. I'm just going to follow the rules and see what I get. Part of the motivation of this project is to understand better what the gravitational path, <coughs> path integral is doing. So we will not give it any specific interpretation and just follow the rules. And by the rules, I mean that I'll be, I'll be including um, connected topologies which have been proven to be what gives you all of the interest in physics in the gravitational path integral. The inclusion of connected topologies, even when the boundary conditions are disjoint, meaning that my boundary has um, various connected components. The inclusion of connected topologies has been given us quite a few unexpected answers. Some good, some bad. On the good side, when we all thought that semi-classical physics wouldn't be able to encode or tell us anything about the unitarity of black hole evaporation, well, the gravitational path integral turned out to be able to actually reproduce a unitary answer for the page curve uh, for the Hawking radiation. Another unexpected answer that we got from the gravitational path integral is the fact that gravitational correlation functions do not factorize. This is presented as a, is, is, is seen as a puzzle because of course uh, you would expect completely independent um, conformal field theories to just not talk to each other. But by holographic duality, it looks like the gravitational path integral wants to connect these theories and make them not factorizable. Another interesting object which we've been, where we've seen that um, connected topologies make an interesting appearance is when looking at the free energies. This was looked at last year by Engel, Harfi, Shetty, and Maloney. And a compelling and simple 
reason to expect that contributions from connected topologies to the free energy should be accounted for is the simple fact that if you expect to reproduce the vanishing of Rennie entropies for a pure state, the only way you can get that identically is if you include connected topologies in the computation of the free energy. When talking about replica tricks, this is a replica trick apart from the one that you have to do when considering the computation of the von Neumann entropy. And so this at least gives you a motivation for why you should include connected topologies. And once you include them, you should try to understand what, what happens um, and what is different when you include them versus when you not, when you do not. When talking about free energies and including versus not including connected topologies, I'm talking about the difference between annealed versus quenched quantities. The annealed free energy can be understood as a situation in which I compute an average over my ensemble of theories. And let me just for a moment borrow, <coughs> borrow the, the language of ensemble averaging. So I compute an average over my theories, and then I take the logarithm that gives me the partition function. In the language of condensed matter theory, this would be the situation in which I'm letting my random variables equilibrate before, <coughs> before computing the free energy. The interesting quantity that we will want to look at is the quenched free energy. That's the situation in which I do not let my random variables equilibrate, but instead compute the free energy of every member of my ensemble and then average over my <coughs> over my free energies. Okay, so that's the object we, we are interested in looking at. But now the question is, I've roughly told you what the overline partition function uh, is given by, but I haven't told you what the overline logarithm is given by. So the question is, how does the gravitational path integral compute these overline z? So a simple thing we can do is to just look at a mathematical identity, which is this one, which relates the logarithm of z to some specific limit um, of n goes to zero of this quantity. For those familiar with the replica trick, this might be reminiscent of what you do when computing von Neumann entropies, or more generally, when computing Rennie entropies for general values of m. This replica trick, thought of as a rel replica trick, is slightly different. We're no longer taking a limit n goes to one. We're going to m goes to zero. And this will prove to be a slightly trickier regime to, to work with. So given this identity, you might think, okay, let, let's just put overlines on both sides and we should be done, right? If I put the overline on my right-hand side, what I have is the path integral over replicated boundaries, and then I'm allowing for connected topologies to contribute, and the object I should get out is some overlined logarithm of z. Well, that's not quite good enough. Um, in general, this continuation of m to non-integers is ill-defined. So at the very least, if you do this, uh, you're going to get ambiguous answers. And more generally, you might even get unphysical answers. Um, and that's indeed what um, Sebastian, Netta, and Alex observed when looking at this trick for JT gravity. The result they were obtaining is some non-monotonic <coughs> non free energy, which um, for a thermal free energy means that your entropies are negative, and so that makes no sense. And so you have to do better. You have to resolve this ambiguity and try to get sensible answers. There's been some related work to what um, Sebastian, Alex, and, and Netta started exploring in trying to make sense of JT gravity and the free energy in it. This related work mostly tries to make use of the matrix model approach. And so Clifford Johnson, for example, um, <coughs> looked at the matrix model completions, non-perturbative completions, in the limit that the temperature is extremely low, and tried to get some uh, sensible answers for the free energy. But this is a very 
model-specific um, type of approach. Okuyama also tried um, looking at a Gaussian model and computing the free energy, the quenched free energy directly, getting some sensible results, and then also explored some different formula for the free energy, uh, different from the one that I'm giving here. Um, sorry, different from this kind of replica trick that I'm giving here. So Okuyama explored a different formula. The problem with that formula is that it requires knowledge of connected correlators or arbitrary M in a very exact way. And generally, we don't quite have control over exact values of every connected correlator at every M sufficiently to make sense of this formula. <clears throat> okay, so the approach is presented by Clifford Johnson and uh, Kazumi Okuyama are not quite general enough for us to try to make sense of the gravitational path integral. So we would like to find some more general prescription for how to compute quenched free energies um, in quantum gravity. These two authors actually have many single author papers. So if you actually are curious about which ones I'm referring to here, should be the ones with free energy in their title. So <laughs> should be easy to find. Okay. All right, so enough introduction. <clears throat> Let me get to a general prescription. We want to go to a regime where we actually have control over what this gravitational path integral means. So let me assume I can suppress um, higher topologies and complicated contributions to the gravitational path integral and work in a classical regime or semi-classical regime where we can just look at saddle points. In ads -EFT, this might be a large chain limit. Uh, if we are thinking about JT gravity, this is taking S not large, so that higher genera are suppressed. And then when we are in this classical limit, we might consider constraining our regime or our domain of integration for the path integral to just replica symmetric manifolds. Since the boundary conditions are replica symmetric, it's not crazy to expect that configurations contributing in a dominant way will be also replica symmetric. It could be the case that the replica symmetry break-in occurs, but that's something we'll have to live with and an assumption <clears throat> of our prescription. We'll assume replica symmetry. The reason we do that is that then we have the privilege of using the Lukowitz policy in a construction in which we can quotient. Once we quotient by the replica symmetry, we can work in the quotient theory and in the quotient the theory, the replica parameter M gets translated in some, into some conical defect opening angle. And opening angles have no preference for any specific values. So what used to be an integer M can be easily analytically continued to a non-integer M. Yes? I'm assuming they only have some cyclic subsymmetry. Okay. Yes. Although, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, please interrupt me anytime um, if you have any questions. Right, so once we are in the quotient, uh, we can follow the usual steps uh, in order to compute the free energy. What we are basically going to do, once we are in the quotient, we have a well-defined analytic continuation based on basically just looking for solutions or saddle points of our quotient theory. Log z will become just in a saddle point approximation, the action of the solution to the replica symmetry um, setting. Since we are working in the quotient theory, we can actually write this down as just m times the action of the quotiented solution, where here we are not including contributions from the conical defects as usual. And then we can simply take the limit following the saddle point solutions that we've been uh, looking at and get the evaluation of the logarithm, the overline logarithm, as the action of the saddle point in the limit m goes to zero. This should be understood as a limit, even though I, I made it kind of exact here. 
because obviously the m goes to zero limit is going to be a tricky one, and working at exactly m equals zero will not be possible. Let me compare that with what you get for the annealed result. If you were just computing the annealed free energy, you would be taking the logarithm of the overlined z bar. In that case, you're just evaluating the action of the m equals one saddle. Or you can think of it as the quotient. It doesn't matter, it's the same. And so the answers are obviously different. So the key takeaway from this is, in general, if the m equals, um, <clears throat> if the limit of m goes to zero of the quotient theory happens to include contributions from connected topologies, then in general, what you get out here is going to be very different from what you get out here. So the quenched quantity is going to be very different from the annealed one. We'll of course be interested in a situation in which that's the case, in which the quenched free energy differs from the annealed one, and that will correspond to indeed having non-trivial saddle points um, as m goes to zero, other than the usual disconnected topology. Right, so if you look at that, you might think, okay, the, what are you saying that is new? I mean, this is all just the um, usual LM recipe. Well, I would argue that in fact, if you reorder our author names, this is actually much more interesting. You, you get the chef recipe. So for me, that was compelling enough to consider this an interesting proposal. But if you don't buy that, let me say, <coughs> A few words about uh, the interesting corner of repli replicas that we are looking at. We no longer have the comfort of looking at m equals one or perturbations around it, as was the case in LM. The fact that we were looking at saddle points around m um, in the LM situation gave rise to this very nice geometric shortcut that the Ryutaki and Aga formula is. In our situation, we're going to take a limit to n goes to zero. We're not going to be just interested in variations about that region, but in the actual value of the action. So it's tricky to expect any geometric shortcut in this case. So presumably, whatever answer we get is going to be um, pretty different from anything we are used to. This is just rephrasing with what I just said. <coughs> and just emphasizing the fact that for some reason these m goes to zero saddle points are going to be um, encoding quench generating functionals in quantum gravity. I've been talking about free energies, but more generally what we are computing is quench generating functionals of connected correlators. And so correlation functions will be affected by these connected topologies that we are including. And so what is so special about m goes to zero um, what makes it so special is, is something that we would like to understand. And so that's why we are going to try to understand these m equals zero creatures. Let me make some general comments about replica geometries, replica quotient, <coughs> replica quotient geometries, so that we familiarize ourselves a bit more with it before trying to zoom in to n goes to zero. In general, the quotient manifold is going to have defects with opening angle two pi over m. And a simple way of modeling these defects in, in gravity is to just include co-dimension two Namugoto cosmic brains with a specific tension. The tension will model how much defect we get. You can see that n equals one is a quite special place. It gives you a transition between positive and negative tensions and as a result between conical deficits and conical excesses. We might be used to conical deficits for m greater than one for the Rennie entropies. For m smaller than one, which is what we'll be probing, we actually have conical excesses. And in particular, in the limit m goes to zero, we get a huge conical excess. Um, and you might think, well, with such a huge conical excess, what is it that we actually get? Uh, what does the geometry look like? So let me give you a little bit of a flavor of how to think of this um, quite singular limit. As usual, locally, the curvatures for a um, the conical tip, if you 
if you were to include it in the manifold, looks like a delta function in the Ricci scalar. And locally, the, the metric in the normal directions to wherever the defect is located will look, at this, will look like this. Uh, we have two dimensions, normal to the brain. It was a co-dimension two brain. And the metric can be written in this form. This is the usual form of a conical defect. And as you can see, if you take the limit m goes to zero, this is going to be pretty singular. Let me just do a simple change of coordinates so that um, we can have a less singular picture of what this looks like. Um, if you just do this replacement that I specified here in complex coordinates, this is nothing but just a conformal map from a disk to, to a cylinder. So if you do, th do this replacement that you can basically map say we are working in the Poincare disk. You can map the disk to something like a strip. Um, we can send the conical defect here of two pi over m opening angle to minus infinity. So it becomes the branch point goes to minus infinity. This branch cut can be mapped to these two lines which have to be periodically identified. And so in this situation, what we get is just an infinite strip with periodic boundary conditions, if you like, with Dirich layer boundary conditions of the defect, which is at, at minus infinity. And then the limit m goes to zero is the limit in which you fill in a half plane. Um, at least personally, I find this a bit more intuitive than this situation. And here you can see that th th there's nothing too crazy about taking the m goes to zero limit. You're just setting up a problem where you have specific boundary conditions at various places and you want to take the n goes to zero limit. Yes? Yeah, I just want to understand the experience. There is a general zero limit. Yes. And you are introducing these classic breaks that are essentially neutral in general. At some point, you're going to introduce negative tension breaks. Are these negative tension breaks that are the same type that you have where the density is the ones that let you do this dynamical metric differences or some other kind of thing? And the, the, these brains are, we can think of them as just boundary conditions to implement the kind of conical defects that we need for the quotient geometry. Um, and we are going to have to solve for them dynamically where the location is and so on. Um, not sure if that answers your question. Sorry, can you? This left line says minus infinity. Oh, uh, this should go to minus infinity. This green line is meant to correspond to the conical defect. The conical defect gets mapped to minus infinity, so, so this should go to minus infinity. Um, so basically, the boundary of the Poincare disk is getting mapped to this vertical segment. This branch, branch cut corresponds to these two lines that should be periodically identified, and the branch point is going to minus infinity. sense? Is it not a manifold? Well, you have, a, you have an infinite line and you make a little bit of point to the contrary one of those points. Yeah. At least it's not, it's not something that you can really it's not, <laughs> it's not Hausdorff, presumably, <laughs> um, or locally Euclidean. Okay. Um, Yes, I. Yes, I. I yeah, I, I sympathize. There, there might be one of the axioms of a manifold that you 
break due to this m goes to zero limit, um, or at m equals zero. In the end, any treatment that we uh, follow will have to deal with the limit, so it, it's, it's just going to be the limiting behavior that we care about, so we are not actually going to try to solve the problem for m exactly equal to zero. Um, if you try to work exactly with m equal to zero, you might want to take care of those subtleties, I guess. Yeah. Could you cut the brain out of the statement and the thing at m equal zero is still a manifold? But when there's m equal zero, well, you can't actually cut it. I mean, if as usual, you, you exclude the tip of the cone from your manifold, you do get a manifold, so. Yeah, it's somehow even worse than that. <laughs> like, it's, well, I mean, you exclude that, that tip, then you can't get I think once you exclude that point, it, you're fine. Yeah. Like, how, I, I mean, just wondering what happens. Um, yes. And in this picture, you can reintroduce that point, if you like, by just setting specific boundary conditions there. Um, and that way it makes sense of the limit, or the specific n equals zero. Yeah. Okay, more questions. Okay, so now that we've, we have a general prescription, let me try to see what happens with JT. Um, first of all, uh, let me remind you what the general geometric picture of JT is. H how are we doing with time? Uh, we're doing well. I think we should have at least 35 minutes. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So in, in JT, the usual story is that we have, uh, we can integrate out the dilaton. Once we integrate out the dilaton, what we get is that the path integral over geometries collapses into a path integral over Riemann. Riemann manifolds, Riemann surfaces of constant negative curvature. And if we further collapse that path integral to just replica symmetric manifolds, the kind of situation we can get when we have M replicas um, is just two different scenarios, either a fully connected phase or a fully disconnected phase. When we have M replicas, the fully disconnected phase corresponds to just having a bunch of disks. And that's the situation that we are not going to be interested in. If we had that situation as the dominant contribution to the path integral when computing free energies, we would just get annealed results. Or the quenched free energy would coincide with the annealed free energy, and that's not interesting. We're going to be interested in the situation in which um, dominant contributions come from fully connected geometries. The fully connected geometry for a replicated boundary looks like a connected wormhole of this sort. The replica symmetry means that the throat of every, every one of these asymptotic boundaries has the same size. And so in the fully connected phase, we actually get a one parameter family of geometries parametrized by the proper size of these throats. When we go to the quotient picture, well, the quotient the replica quotient of this geometry looks like is something like this. It's conformally related to a Poincare disk with two def defects. The two defects have opening angle two pi over m, as we were seeing before. The two defects are associated to the fixed points of the replica symmetry, and so you can um, potentially visualize where they are coming from in this picture. Those are the words I have set. This branch cut is in general going to be smooth in the quotient geometry, even though I um, showed it explicitly there. And the one parameter family of solutions that before were parametrized by the proper size of the throats is going to now be parametrized by the proper separation between the defects. So when looking at these geometries, we'll have a free parameter or modulus that is going to be this proper separation. Now these are just pictures and in order to give you a bit of a flavor for um, what this geometry looks like or where it comes from, let me show some equations. I'm not going to be able to show you a simple metric just giving you um, or just describing this geometry. 
turns out to not be so simple to write down a simple metric with simple coordinate charts. But let me show you where can you get started in order to understand this geometry. The geometry comes from just the equation of motion of the dilaton in JT gravity that imposes a constant negative curvature. And if you have conical defects, you have extra delta functions in the Ricci scalar, as we showed before. Um, you can just use some green function of the Laplacian in two dimensions to repack those delta functions into logarithms. And so at the end of the day, if you want to write a conformally flat metric, um, you can write it in this way. And what you get for the equation of motion of the dilaton is an equation that describes what the conformal factor does. Here, alpha is parametrizing the location of the, de of the defects. And so the conformal factor for this quotient um, geometry will obey this equation. If you are able to provide a solution to this equation um, in just a unit disk and give it to me, I'll be super happy. Usually, um, or w what we found, it's not so simple to find a solution to this equation in a simple domain. Um, so sometimes you might use numerics to solve Liouville's equation in a specific regime where you might be interested in. Yes. This guy has no conical defects. Sigma tilde has no conical defects. And sigma, so sigma tilde is the version of sigma where you subtract it out of the conical defects. Exactly. So that you get a Louisville's equation that makes sense and that you can work with numerically or try to solve in some other way. A general approach you can follow in order to obtain a metric for this quotient geometry is just to uh, look for some map from the quotient geometry to the Poincare disk and then obtain a metric by pulling back. In general, it's not too hard to come up with such a map and get a terribly complicated, complicated metric. But if you want something more reasonable and a metric that is interesting and that you can handle, for example, a conformally flat metric, which is useful for physical and technical reasons, then this map is not so easy to find. So if you want to try to find a conformal map from the quotient geometry to the Poincaré disk and obtain the metric by pullback, that's going to be a challenge. So the best we could do, which is useful if you're trying to uh, look at quantum matter is what, the, what is the disruption that is obeyed by this conformal map? And so there's a similar problem to the um, schwartz christoffel mapping in this, in place here. So we, you can set up the problem from the quotient geometry to the Poincaré disk as a problem about um, circular arc polygons mapping onto a disk. And this is the disruption you find after some work, if you're interested in doing semi-classical computations with quantum matter, then this is the kind of object that will show up in the stress tensor and that you can use to do these kind of computations. This is a rephrasing of this problem, in fact. If you're able to find a solution to this problem, you also have a solution here and vice versa. So if you solve any of those, let me know. The problem is usually to solve those um, in a coordinate range that is easy to handle. And by that I mean that you have charts uh, with images that are easy to, to handle and to work with when doing computations um, in whichever geometry you're looking at. Okay, so those are some technical details about dealing with this geometry that we'll actually, we will not need in, in subsequent slides. So let me just forget about this and show you um, a bit more about the computation that we tried to do with JT. So in JT, what we are after is the computation of the action on semi-classical saddle points. 
JT doesn't have a good relationship with saddle points. If you look at integer m for m equal or greater than, than two, the dilaton usually has no solutions. Well, generally has no solution because you have no Killen fields. For m equals two, you actually have a solution, but you cannot stabilize the modulus. The solution on the double trumpet wants to make the throat shrink to zero size in order to minimize the action. And so in general, JT for integer m doesn't have interesting saddle points except for m equals one. Nonetheless, there's nothing stopping you from just setting up the problem of JT gravity in a quotient geometry and trying to search for solutions if they exist for m non-integer. So that's what we are going to do next. And even if our result is not satisfactory, this is a warm up for what we'll be doing next, okay? In order to evaluate the JT action, we can get rid of a bunch of terms which are just topological and give us um, the usual Euler character of whichever manifold we're looking at. This term goes to zero just because we are fixing the curvature to R equals one by the dilaton path integral. And the only dynamics that remain correspond to this boundary term. So all the dynamics in JT gravity get mapped to this boundary term <coughs> and get preserved by a specific choice of boundary conditions, which is the following. The boundary conditions are described as follows. We choose a cutoff boundary at some level set of the dilaton. Level set is defined here as one over delta. And we take the limit delta goes to zero by keeping the proper length of this uh, cutoff boundary fixed as a ratio with the size of the dilaton. This ratio gives us beta, which is the object that we usually identify with the inverse temperature. And so we have ma mapped all the complexity or dynamics of JT gravity to the dynamics of this boundary curve, which I'm going to call the wiggle. And so finding solutions to JT gravity becomes a problem of finding solutions to the wiggle on this quotient geometry that has two conical defects. If you're familiar with the story about JT gravity, there's something that you could expect as an answer for this problem. The dynamics of the wiggle would be um, governed by a, by a Schwarzschild action. The Schwarzschild action shows up in for m equals one and m equals two. But for more general m, you get a bit more of a rich behavior because you're breaking some extra symmetries. The U1 symmetry that you have for m equals one and m equals two is no longer present. And so what you get is not just the Schwarzschild action, but what I'm calling a, an interacting Schwarzschild. We get extra contributions or extra terms, um, which basically encode how the defects affect the dynamics of the wiggle. To find explicitly what this um, modified action looks like, we just need to look at the asymptotic boundary here, C is some elliptic radial coordinate um, that is convenient here. And we only care about the subleading term that if you work out explicitly, and one can do so, and I'm not gonna show it because it's a bit complicated, but this term will depend on both the modulus, the proper separation between the defects, and also the replica parameter M. That term will show up when we do the treatment of the wiggle uh, in the action. So as usual, the wiggle is defined as some diffeomorphism between a uh, circle of length beta and the asymptotic circle or cutoff boundary where we impose the condition of the metric that it take this form. And when we do the exercise of expressing the dynamics of this wiggle in terms of this uh, diffeomorphism, what we get is the usual distortion plus an additional term. That additional term is related to this one here, of course. For n equals one and two, as a sanity check, you indeed get that this term is equal to minus one third in this case, which kills this term. So you get the Schwarzschild alone, alone. But more generally for general m, we'll have to deal with this extra term, which is in fact what is going to give us interest in dynamics. Now if you derive the equations of motion from this, you get a bit of a complicated equation, but somehow magically you are able to solve this analytically and so with some patience, 
we were able to do that. And once we find solutions for the wiggle here, we are able to evaluate the action. And the result is, looks simple, looks like this. Although if you look at the title, you might suspect that it's not going to be so simple. So <clears throat> just as a sanity check, if you look at this action that we obtain for solutions to the wiggle, for n equals one, we get an answer that is independent of the modulus. That is expected because for m equals one, we really have no defects. So the proper separation between the defects means nothing. For n equals two, we do get a dependence on the proper separation between the defects. It's quadratic. Similarly, if we were to write this in terms of the throat sizes, it would also be quadratic as we expect and would be minimized, um, the action would be minimized by making the proper separation go to zero. That's the usual instability of the modulus that we find for JT, for the double trumpet. Those are two sanity checks. Now we can go to the insane part, which is the more general M. And this is what we get. What we get. <clears throat> so here I'm showing you the action here against M from zero to two, I guess, three. For some fixed value of A and M, sorry, A and beta. The red line is the value of the action. The blue lines are just different branches of the inverse cinch here. And I'm just plotting them so that you have some idea of where this red curve is coming from. You can see it has all sorts of crazy things, it has gaps, and it goes to minus infinity as we go to M goes to zero. That looks like a problem. The action going to minus infinity as m goes to zero is a problem for various reasons. One of them is lo it looks like the quotient geometry with defects, which is the connected phase, would seem to dominate always regardless of the regime we are at. That's not what we expect. In general, there should be some regime in which the annealed answer is a good approximation to the quenched one. Perhaps a more serious worry is just the fact that it diverges going to minus infinity, which would, be, would give you infinite free energies. But actually the answer is so bad that it's good in the sense that if you look at the, the wiggle solutions that you got, they're actually unstable. Here I'm showing you the eigenvalue of the stability operator, which is the operator acting on quadratic deformations away from the wiggle solution. The eigenvalues are negative when the solution is unstable and positive when they are stable. So for m smaller than one, we see that all the eigenvalues want to be negative. So the wiggle solutions for which we were evaluating this object are actually unstable solutions. There are no stable solutions for the wiggle for m smaller than one. So we see that m smaller than one is a very special place. There's no inconsistency with um, other treatments of JT gravity because in fact a saddle point approximation makes no sense in this regime. We could try to perform some more refined analysis in which we keep an integral over the modulus and that's something we haven't tried but we could. But we are interested in going to this regime of saddle points to test our prescription so instead we're going to try to modify the theory and see if we can go to a model in which we do have interesting saddle points to evaluate. The transition yes. exactly at one? Sorry? The transition to, from positive eigenvalue to negative? Yes. Is it exactly at one? That's right, yeah. Okay. Yes. It, it's related to this fact that the tension is yeah, um, so it's changing it's signs, so that chain of sign uh -huh. also in the defect uh -huh. um, crops up in multiple so places. Right. Yeah. And, well, this is the least of our problems at this point, but also the modulus is not stabilized. Uh, even for these unstable wheels. Okay, so what can we do? We can try to add matter to JT and see if that helps. The reason you could expect it to help is because, well, in JT you have a, this parameter that governs how suppressed higher topologies are. So if you have a competition between that and classical sources or matter, you could expect some competition between one kind of saddle points and the other. So we introduce um, conformal matter, a massless scalar, because it's the simplest thing you can think of and something that you can actually handle very easily. 
you can turn the, in, if you solve, uh, so, okay. So for the conformal scalar, the equation of motion is very simple. It tells you that the, uh, the scalar field is going to be harmonic. You can write down explicit solution in the bulk. You can write it explicitly in terms of boundary conditions. Boundary conditions can be specified by some sign on. And once you specify all of your solution in terms of um, boundary quantities, you can turn your integral over the manifold into a boundary integral. The boundary integral takes the form of some integral over sources against some integral kernel, which you can write down, write down explicitly, but it's very complicated, so I'm not showing it here. The point is, once we have written down the action purely in terms of boundary terms, we can see how it interacts with the boundary action that we got for the wiggle, and that way derive equations of motion in this new theory. Is this phi is not the dilaton? It's the boundary profile of the scalar field? Exactly, yes. Um, yes, I guess I was using big phi for the dilaton. So this these phi here is the boundary profile. So it's the, the wiggle. Yeah. Uh, and that one here as well. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so the equation of motion that you get after you do this is basically what we had previously, plus this extra term coming from here. Um, and this actually makes the equation quite a bit more complicated. It's become uh, an integral differential equation where we have a non-local term. It is not too surprising to see this non-local term. Basically, in JT gravity, we're saying that the boundaries are specified by level sets of the dilaton. Once we introduce matter, dilaton interacts with the matter. That interaction will change the location of the boundary. But it is at the boundary where we are specifying boundary conditions for the matter field. So you can see heuristically, at least there, um, why you would expect such a non-local non -local term. Okay. So we are not going to be able to obtain any analytic or explicit results once we add this non-local term. So <clears throat> we'll have to proceed with numerics. And a starting point where we can try to see if the addition of this <coughs> matter field is helping is to just see if we can get a stable modulus for the double trumpet. And so that's what we did. If you look at the double trumpet, you get some silver, some silver lining. Um, there appears modulus saddles for n equals zero as we tune the matter profile, make it compete with the topologically suppressed um, geometries. So here I'm showing you the action against the modulus. This is not quite the proper distance between the defects, but it's related to it. So the action between, <coughs> sorry, the action as a function of the modulus for no matter profile, for no matter, is just monotonic. You get no saddles. As you increase the amplitude of the scalar at infinity, things seem to get better. And as you increase it further, you do develop a saddle. Okay, so that's good news. It's a proof of principle. You do get new saddles um, for the modulus. <coughs> so now the question is, will this saddles of the modulus make it all the way to m smaller than one. As we've seen, the m equals one is a very special place, and m smaller than one um, can bring some very complicated behavior, at least that's what, what we saw in pure JT. So will these saddles survive the journey to m smaller than one? And the answer turns out to be yes. And since we were very happy when we found out um, that this was the case, we gave it the name, the little saddle that could. So the situation the, for the little saddle that could is the following. As you go to m smaller than one, there appear, there appear two branches of solutions for the wiggle. The two branches are these ones. Here I'm plotting the action against the modulus again. The branch in the bottom has a saddle, a minimum. That's a minimum for the modulus, so that's precisely what we wanted. Here I'm showing the stability analysis as before. These branch on the bottom, which is the one that has a saddle, corresponds precisely to the positive eigenvalues, so it is 
Um, it is giving us stable solutions for the wiggle. So at least we have stable wiggles, stable modulus, which is what we wanted. The final ingredient that we needed was dominance of these disconnected, sorry, these connected topologies over the disconnected phase. And indeed, by tuning the amplitude of the scalar, you can make the saddle dominate over the disconnected phase. And therefore, we are in a situation in which we have precisely this kind of saddle points that we are after. These are saddle points which give us a non-trivial answer for the quenched free energy that will be different from the annealed result. Sorry, can you repeat that? Can you say uh, what the physical interpretation is of that tuning or of that critical value that makes the vertical saddle dominate over the vertical saddle? Um, so. Because generally, I think I would, it would help me out a little bit more of an understanding of what the, what the physical question is that is being asked. Because I mean, I, just, just as, a, as an example, you know, we could, we could ask about. Um, Mm -hmm. versus the average entropy, it would be an elegant question that would be yep. the hawking of a base curve. Um, and, you know, we, we can say, we can ask the when, when does, you know, when does this connected geometry dominate? We can ask for the uh, optimization time. You know, there'd be sort of physical statements like right. that. Right, so, <clears throat> yeah, at, at this point, well, the phenomenon we are after, ideally, would be a situation in which um, you compute the quenched quantity compared to the annealed one. One gives you reasonable answers, the other one doesn't. For example, for the von Neumann entropy, one gives you unitarity, the other one doesn't. For the inclusion of connected topologies. So both yeah. answers, essentially? I mean, if you, if you, if you insert it, then yes. as, as average, okay. then Good. So, in, yeah. so in, in this situation, uh, precisely, if in this situation, um, for example, what, what Neta, Sebastian, and Alex were finding, the quenched free energy, or rather, the annealed free energy gives you a non-monotonic answer. And that's not compatible with an interpretation as a canonical partition function. But that's something that can happen when you compute annealed quantities. The quenched free energy, you could expect that it gives you the physical answer. Um, precisely because in that case, what you're computing is an average over partition functions. Sorry, an average over free energies. The average over the free energies should exhibit that monotonicity. So in this case, if we are computing a quenched free energy, we should expect a behavior of that kind. And so. Oh. This point is itself monotonic. Yes. Um, yes. We are trying to go to or come up with a setting in which a semi, semi classical approximation is all we need to make sense of the quenched answer. Because the question was what's the boundary of the dominance of the sum network? Right. Is the, is the boundary between you can do that and you cannot? Dominant composition comes Oh, but. <coughs> I mean, if, if we have a situation in which um, for some regime we have saddles, for another regime we do not, that could be signaling that um, you would expect extra contributions perhaps making the quenched result different from the annealed one. What we are trying to find is a situation where we don't lose control over the semi-classical computation. We want to have saddles on both sides, but non-trivial saddles. And so, um, ideally, we want to find saddles that also give us the interest in behavior for the quenched result. And kind of sharp um, physical difference that we could expect between the annealed and the quenched answer could be seen perhaps by computing explicitly correlation functions. 
So in principle, all we are doing here is compute generating functionals. If we look at explicitly at a correlator, at a correlator um, the annealed and quest answer will differ. We don't have a clear picture of how they will, um, but that's kind of the, one of the questions that we would like to address. Okay, any, any more questions? Okay, so <clears throat> the plot here is for m equal 0.75. There's nothing special about these values, just some value smaller than one. These saddles appear as soon as you go to m smaller than one. m equals one has no saddles, simply because you have no dependence on the modulus. So all the interesting all these saddles or these family appears for and smaller. And now the question is, can we keep track of this saddle all the way to m equals zero? If we can do that, that means we have a reliable semi-classical computation to do in this model, and one that will give us an answer for the quenched free energy that differs, differs from the annealed one. And so that's just an, uh, was, was there a question? And so that's just a numerical um, exercise at this point. This is just a plot as a, this is the previous plot. We can keep track of the little saddle at smaller, smaller m. You can go to 0 0.7, 0 0.65, 0 0.6. You see that the saddle just stays there. There's nothing that changes particularly. We could go all the way to m, 0.55. And that's where the story ends, just because we haven't had time to do more. Um, but the main takeaway is this saddle is not going anywhere. It's staying there. It's just a matter of keeping track of it all the way to m equals zero in order to do this computation of the quenched free energy. We don't know. So the, the um, conservative answer is we don't know. So we have to. Um, keep trying. It could be that something specific or special happens for a smaller m. Um, Yes. I'd like to understand what that means physically. Good. Um, when, when, the, Good. When, when the connected geometries don't dominate, let's say in a black hole evaporation story, right, that means that the state of the optimum radiation itself is not the same. Mm -hmm. right? It's more or less the same in every theory. Right? So here, So uh, ideally, um, ideally we would just look at a theory where we don't need to tune any particular parameters and where we just have interesting saddle points that we can track. In this case, that's not the situation, so we have to introduce some extra ingredients. Those ingredients are classical sources. So the classical sources mean we are no longer going to be dealing with a thermal state. Um, if the classical sources are small enough, we still don't get an interesting quenched free energy. Um, still the dominant saddle is the annealed one. You need to make these sources large enough. What that means, I suppose, is we're modifying the state by including these classical sources. 
right. So in some sense, it is the introduction of this classical source that is causing um, it's causing a quenching that is non-trivial. Um, Yes. So um, if you know, one possible resolution to our other question would be, you know, what we want is some some change in the structure of the saddles that becomes important at low temperatures, because that's where you need to start distinguishing between the quenching and yield free energies. Mm -hmm. So is it possible that this tuning that you have to do to get this saddle to adhere is much easier to do at lower energies, for example? That do you only have to give the system a tiny little kick Right, so um, I guess what, what you're suggesting there is presumably if we go to sufficiently small temperatures, the kind of amplitude that we need to turn on for the scalar or how much we need to source um, the state. Um, so it, it will require sourcing the state much less. And presumably at very high temperatures, you need to do something very crazy, introduce very strong classical sources. Yes, so, yeah. That, if, this, if this approach is no, supposed I, to be something physically meaningful, that seems like one way to get it. That's right. You definitely have to make the temperatures lower if you want the, the, the classical sources to not be too crazy. Um, Am I trivial? Yeah, I, would, yeah. I would expect that you come all very close to having to destroy the theory at the point where you so sensitive that the spectrum becomes so sensitive to you know. Right. Okay. Yes, and, well, I, mean, I, I guess uh, at this point, um, yeah, so the interplay between the amplitude of the scalar and the temperature is something we haven't investigated yet, but it's definitely something we should investigate. I don't have any particularly insightful thoughts on an ensemble averaging interpretation of when these saddles begin to appear versus when they don't. That's part of what we would like to understand better. Um, so hopefully in the next few days slash weeks slash months, we will be able to. Um, So this is the stage at, at which we are at. <coughs> and so, um, this is, I don't know how we're doing with time, but. Good, I'll, I'll get to a brief discussion. So we've seen that this saddle appears. It's not clear if it will make it to M equals zero. Um, hopefully it does, because it will give us a test ground for these um, dominance of quenched free energy being different from a annealed one. We'd like to see what 
properties the result in generating functional has that differ from the annealed result because that will have consequences on the correlation functions. And particularly here, because we're inserting sources, classical sources, if you just compute the two-point function for the scalar, you expect different, different answers in the quenched versus the annealed results. We don't have a clear picture of what it really is, um, what, what really the difference is. The intuition from higher replicas for m integer higher than one is usually not very um, helpful in this regime. m smaller than one is very different. So we don't quite know what to expect about the two-point functions as we go to the m equals zero saddle. More general questions that we are interested in is, is there a simple diagnostic? When com computing this m goes to zero saddle is very complicated as we've seen already for JT. And in more general theories, presumably harder, is there a simple diagnostic for when, when the quenched saddle points are going to differ from the annealed ones? Um, and at the physical level, this is related to what Raphael was asking about um, what is the physics or the situation in which we expect the quenching to differ significantly. I'm particularly interested in this second point, which is, is there some correlation between dominance of replica wormholes for integer m and for m smaller than zero? This would amount to some relation between when um, computations of, say, von Neumann entropies get contributions from connected geometries um, and situations where we get contributions from connected geometries to the free energy. Are those correlated? I would expect they would be, but at the mathematical level, I don't see why they would be related. Then are there any universal features we can understand about this limit? It's a particularly obscure one, so it would be nice to understand if there is some um, general notion we can have for what this means when you compute saddle points. And finally, um, something that would help pr presumably understand all of these points is to have some other toy model example where we can look at and goes to zero saddles. Um, but I cannot think of anything simpler than JT that is non-trivial. And so if you have any ideas, I'd be happy to listen to you. And with that, I'll, I'll conclude there. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions for Sergio? Yes. I, I guess uh, I didn't understand how confident you are that applying saddle point uh, approximation should be trusted at all in these approaches. Here, right? Because, I mean, if we, if we go with closure, Um, if, if I think about the solutions to smaller and smaller m quotients, I mean, physically, I, I would encounter the problem that you're raising of hyperplankian curvatures um, or super high temperatures. I suppose. Um, I would like to not think about this replica computation physically 
and just mathematically as a saddle point approximation that I'm making in the m goes to zero limit. So in that case, I feel more comfortable about well, taking the mathematical I, I, limit. I'm saying this concept, right? I, don't, I don't see any reason why that doesn't make sense. I think this P is not thermal circles plus the length. It's two thermal circles. The situation he's considering, the thing he's replicating is a single thermal circle at fixed rate <laughs> and creates new boundaries at higher numbers. Uh, yeah. And that's true. What, what we are replicating is the boundary, the number of boundaries. Uh, we're not doing anything to a specific thermal circle. But yes. That's correct. Sorry? Going to M peaks more than one. If we're doing it in computer and down by LOP and string. I think on a string LOP in computer, if you just go to you know, on every case, at the every case, you know, it's more string. You haven't looked at it. You need to be doing something helpful. Yeah. I, I, I haven't looked at that. Do they ever consider any anything like an M goes to zero limit or just no, no, it's like it's one half? It's, it's one, but it's a non small size. Right. right. If there's anything to right. make it normal. There could be. Physics, it could be a different quality, so it may not. I mean, there could, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, if you don't have a problem, unless you, if you already check that, uh, unless you go to zero, you will see problem, right? So then maybe, like comment maybe it's our idea, like, Yeah, so I mean, the, um, most of the difficulties you face already appear at m smaller than one. And then you kind of solve it at least in my class. Right, like so that's the sense in which we expect just going all the way to m equals zero not being any more problematic or complicated uh, than just transitioning to m smaller than one. Um, yeah, I, yeah. Exactly. So, but for well, normal entropy, of course, we know this is just pretty simple. But yeah. what kind of thing about the correlation function and so on? Exactly. Yeah. So the two point functions will be sensitive to this. Yeah. Um, will, be, will they be sensitive in the same way as entropies are? I don't know. They might encode different physics or different microscopic um, degrees of freedom. So, We are really looking forward to getting an answer, yes, because we don't quite have an expectation of what um, the difference between annealed and quenched correlation functions should look like, so. Um, yes, <laughs> and at the end of the day, it would be nice to have a consistency check by computing the free energy or the quenched free energy by other means, and that would also help us understand whether this m goes to zero limit is actually a sensible thing to do. If you have another method to compute it and you get different answers, then there's, there might be something fundamentally wrong about going to the m equals zero saddle points. But if you do get consistent answers, then maybe this is actually reasonable. <laughs> so the Which one do you average outside the wall? The quenched. Quenched, okay. So the, the problem is that if you want to treat the annealed free energy, free energy as a thermodynamic quantity, it gets pathological because it's non monotonic in the limit t goes to zero, which means that the corresponding entropy gets negative. Uh, okay, yeah, so th that's a problem that was observed by Neta, Sebastian, and Alex. 
it's not clear whether that problem was actually a problem physically with the annealed versus quenched or just a problem with the analytic continuation. Right, absolutely. So, yeah, in principle, I don't know if any of them is pathological or not. Well, I'm sorry, this, you don't need to do an analytic continuation for the annealed free energy. Okay, sorry, yes, so, so the annealed free energy is non-monotonic. So the, the, the question, question yeah. is to try to figure out whether the quenched free energy fixes that. Or that's one question. Yes, that's one question you can try to answer. Yeah. yeah. What I'm wondering is, you know, the, the great, you know, the, the great insight of Lefkowitz and Malvasena was that you didn't actually really need to compute the saddle. Yep. You could just use tricks and symmetry to figure out that the saddle would, the, you know, the conical defect would need to be locally extreme, that it would need to locally satisfy those equations of motion. Yep. So what I'm wondering is whether it's possible to use some similar trick in the m goes to zero limit about evaluating the saddle, but use some property of that limit that, you know, that lets you show only this monotonicity property that you're looking for. You know, only that the beta derivative or some appropriate, you know, beta to the k times the beta derivative has the right monotonicity that you want. Is this something that you thought about at all? It seems like it's the answer to your first question, if such a thing is possible. Um, yeah, so if, if you're trying to see whether the quenched answer gives you the physically meaningful or physically correct picture, that would be a diagnostic. Uh, probably in the, well, in the particular case that we were looking at with turning on sources of scalar fields, you no longer, you're no longer looking to a thermal state. So you, you don't even have an expectation for what the free energy is no longer free, a thermal free energy. It's just a generating functional. So you no longer have an expectation of should it be monotonic or not. If you are actually computing a free energy and expecting a monotonicity, um, then th th that would be, yeah, the, the obvious diagnostic would be, am I getting a pathological answer with the annealed quantity? Yes, then the quenched free energy should be giving a sensible answer. Therefore, it must contrib ha has contributions it must have contributions from connected topologies. But we want to have a direct computation first and then um, a method for diagnosing of that sort. For example, for JT, at least without resorting to, without using matrix models, you don't have a priori a way of computing the quench free energy that is sensible and that gives you a monotonic answer. If you find a way of computing the quench free energy, get a monotonic answer, then you might understand what the diagnostic is. But otherwise, I don't want to put the answer by hand, oh, I get uh, an annealed quantity that doesn't make sense, the quench free energy will have to fix it and therefore have contributions. Well, it could be that the quench also doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. That'd be good. Without yeah. actually having to compute, uh, do, a, do a real saddle point analysis and find the action that was physically desired. Yes. I, maybe it's just not possible. I, I, I think, yeah, I think that would be very hard. Uh, but um, yeah, let me also say, let's thank again the Delphi for free. Uh, you're here to praise. Yeah.